Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is Canon's EOS 1DX Mark III, the company's latest flagship DSLR for pro sports and wildlife photographers. Officially launched in 2020, I had an early chance to field test a pre-production model for motorsports, and in this video, I'll tell you everything that I've learned so far. P.S. Canon asked me to state that all the images I share in this video were shot on pre-production Canon beta sample models, and that the final image quality may vary. Oh, and if you enjoy the videos I produce, don't forget to like and subscribe. Okay, first things first, like all EOS One cameras, the EOS One DX Mark III is a specialist tool designed for a specialist photographer. Some of the features may filter down to more consumer-oriented bodies in the future, but be in no doubt, this is uncompromisingly aimed at the kind of person whose job it is to photograph the World Cup or Olympic Games. Indeed, the EOS One DX Mark III arrives like clockwork four years after the One DX Mark II, which itself followed the original One DX four years before that. This four year cycle is no coincidence as these bodies are designed to showcase Canon's best technology for sports photography in time for each summer Olympic games, which suggests the next model should arrive in 2024 and begs the question whether it'll stay as a DSLR, adopt mirrorless or employ some kind of hybrid technology. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Canon reckons its best technology for high-end sports photography right now remains DSLR. So here's what you'll get for the asking price of around £6,500 or dollars. The EOS 1DX Mark III may look a great deal like its predecessor, but features over 100 updates with Canon improving the image quality, the autofocus, speed and communications. Let's start with the headlines. With a 20.1 megapixel full frame sensor, the 1DX Mark III actually shares the exact same image size as the Mark II, but it's with a new sensor with an equally new low pass filter that Canon reckons allows it to now match 24 megapixel rivals in detail, while also boasting broader dynamic range and lower noise than its predecessor. It'll now shoot faster too, up to 16 frames per second through the optical viewfinder or up to 20 frames per second in live view, whether using an electronic or mechanical shutter and all support continuous autofocus. Yep, 20 frames per second with continuous AF and a mechanical shutter. A new denser 191 point viewfinder AF system employs a CMOS sensor with deep learning to better recognize and track subjects. A new Digic X processor with twin CF Express card slots essentially means a no-limit buffer whether shooting in RAW, JPEG or the new HIF format which delivers 10-bit compressed images. I expect HIF and some version of Digic X to filter down to future Canon bodies and we'll talk more about that later on in the video. It'll film uncropped 4K up to 60p, now thankfully with sensible compression. Dual pixel autofocus is available in 4K movies up to 30p or up to 60p if you switch to a cropped cinema 4K format. There's also the option of 10-bit C-Log or even 12-bit 5.5K raw video all recorded internally if desired. Meanwhile, the tough weather seal body looks almost identical to its predecessor but now features faster gigabit ethernet along with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in addition to a dedicated GPS receiver. There's a new smart controller which allows quick and precise control of the AF point, while the camera itself now squeezes almost 3,000 shots from the same battery pack as before. Like most DSLRs to date, there's no built-in stabilisation, with Canon explaining it's not practical to implement it for the optical path outside of live view. There is, however, electronic stabilisation for movies, which I'll show you later. Before going any further, it's important to talk about Canon's decision to stick with DSLR technology for a camera that will arguably occupy the flagship position until 2024, and it all boils down to the speed and eye relief of the optical viewfinder and the specific job it's aimed at. I filmed this next section through the viewfinder to show you how it looks in action, adjusting the AF area and shooting 16 frames per second bursts. Turn away from my viewfinder sequences if you're sensitive to flickering. Now, Canon's not opposed to electronic viewfinders for many of its cameras and styles of photography, but still believes the lag-free view through an optical viewfinder remains best for pro sports shooters working at the highest level. EVFs can't help but incur a tiny delay as the camera reads and processes the images from the sensor before then displaying it in the viewfinder. To be fair, they're getting quicker with every generation, but optical viewfinders still work at the speed of light, and Canon told me its pro sports photographers still prefer this approach. 
When chatting with some of Canon's sports ambassadors who keep one eye to the viewfinder and the other one open to check out the broader scene, they also mentioned how an optical viewfinder can be less fatiguing over long periods when shooting this way. Of course, it's not a one-sided argument. While Canon has reduced the viewfinder blackout on the 1DX Mark III compared to its predecessor, Sony's A9 avoids it altogether when shooting electronically. There's a wealth of pros and cons to both technologies, and some of the decision between them simply boils down to personal preference. But as far as Canon's concerned, DSLRs are still the best tool for pro sports right now. I wonder if that will still be the case at the 2024 Olympics. Not only is the viewfinder still optical, but Canon's been careful to ensure the overall look and feel of the Mark III remains much the same as its predecessors. Remember, this is not the model where Canon should introduce radical design changes. It's a tool for pros who need to pick it up and start shooting without delay, and they'll feel reassuringly at home here with all the main controls where they expect them. It's a tried and trusted design which just works. That said, Canon has developed one new control for the Mark III that manages to feel both fresh and familiar. It's the new Smart Controller, which effectively turns the AF on button into an alternative way to adjust the AF area position. It uses optical technology, not dissimilar to an upside down computer mouse, to quickly and accurately reposition the AF area by simply brushing your fingertip over the AF on button. At first, it sounds similar to using a screen as a touchpad, but it's easier to reach on the Mark III's larger body and crucially, unlike a touchscreen, works well with gloves or in the rain. In use, it's satisfyingly responsive, yet precise and quickly became my preferred means of moving the AF area on the Mark III, although the joystick still remains available if you prefer a traditional 8-way option. And both the joystick and smart controller are also duplicated for the portrait controls. So unlike the divisive M function bar of the ESR, I'd say the smart controller is a triumph and again it complements rather than replaces familiar controls. Oh, and if you push it in it still works as an AF on button. I'd love to see this featured on future Canon bodies. Push the button to backlight the upper LCD information screen and you'll notice a bunch of buttons on the rear now also become illuminated. It's a feature that Nikon's offered on a selection of models for several generations and something Panasonic also now offers on its full frame Lumix S mirrorless bodies. But amazingly, the 1DX Mark III becomes Canon's first body to actually implement backlit buttons. Better late than never. Canon stitched the compact flash and CFast slots of the Mark II and opted instead for a pair of CF Express Type B slots for the Mark III. Now you'll need to invest in new cards which right now are not exactly cheap but they're incredibly fast and allow the Mark III to not only record the 5.5k raw video but essentially shoot stills without any limits. Canon quotes unlimited JPEG or HIF shooting, or over 1,000 RAW files, which is considerably more than the 170 RAW buffer of the Mark II. Almost the entire left side is occupied by the wealth of ports with thick rubber flaps for protection. The wide Ethernet has been upgraded from 100 megabit to gigabit, and the USB to a 3.1 Gen 2 Type-C port, all as you'd expect, although you can't charge or power the camera over USB, and oddly considering the size of the camera, Canon stuck with mini rather than full-size HDMI. Meanwhile, alongside the microphone and headphone jacks is an N3 remote terminal and a dedicated port to connect the optional WFT E9B accessory to extend the wireless performance. In a handy upgrade over the Mark II, Canon's now equipped the Mark III with built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in addition to the dedicated GPS receiver. Now Wi-Fi was left out of earlier models as the range from a built-in system, especially when housed within such a tough body, wouldn't be sufficient for wireless connectivity in, say, a stadium environment. But Canon's realised it's still useful for closer range communications, say, to your phone. As before, though, you should fit the WFT accessory for the fastest speed and longest range. Canon's also developing secure browser-based remote control over HTTPS, including Live View, and Canon also talked about future cloud processing of RAW files delivering superior noise reduction capabilities. The Mark III employs the same LP E19 battery pack as before, but now squeezes greater life from it, with Canon quoting almost 3,000 shots per charge. The life, of course, varies with use, but during my time with the Mark III shooting long, fast bursts, I achieved well over 3,000 shots, and that also included a few minutes of video and plenty of live view. As a traditional DSLR, the Mark III employs an optical viewfinder with the same 0.76 times magnification and 100% coverage of its predecessor. Again, Canon reckons the absence of delay with optical viewfinders remains preferable for pro sports shooters, even though there's some blackout, albeit now reduced, between frames. 
When shooting through the optical viewfinder, the Mark III features a top burst speed of 16 frames per second with continuous autofocus, a boost over the 14 of the Mark II, and an impressive mechanical achievement. The earlier Mark II could manage 16 frames per second, but only in live view and without autofocus. More importantly, the viewfinder now employs a new 191 point autofocus system with 155 cross type sensors versus the 61 point system of the Mark II, of which 41 were cross type. This allows the Mark III to trump both its predecessor and the older Nikon D5, but the interesting part is the technology behind it. Rather than employ a dedicated autofocus sensor with fixed AF points, the Mark III uses a separate, high-resolution CMOS imaging sensor with its own dedicated Digicate processor. In theory, this could allow a denser or even reconfigurable array, but Canon told me the number and type of AF points were optimised for performance, while the traditional coverage and shape of the array is actually limited by the optical path of the DSLR. Meanwhile, the high resolution of the sensor suggests it could be used for face or even eye detection through the viewfinder, but as a monochrome sensor without any colour capabilities, face detection actually remains more effectively performed by the colour capable metering sensor instead. The autofocus options appear on the surface to be the same as before, apart from the addition of a new option which automatically chooses the best case, and that's what I used in most of my shots that I'll show you later on. But behind the scenes, Canon's revamped the entire system with deep learning, which aims to better identify and track subjects. Unlike AI, deep learning doesn't mean the camera adapts and evolves as you use it. The learning part actually took place earlier while Canon was programming the autofocus system, but in use it really does seem to identify the human subject, which in the case of motor racing I tried it with, was often hiding behind a helmet and sat roughly in the middle of a vehicle. Here's a sequence I shot with the EF 400mm f2.8 using the full autofocusing area and at 16 frames per second where the camera automatically identified and tracked the driver's helmet even though it wasn't the closest part of the main subject approaching me and also the helmet was of course hiding the eyes, the nose and the mouth which would traditionally allow face detection to work. And this wasn't an isolated success either. Throughout multiple bursts the Mark III successfully focused on the driver when using its full autofocus array. Now in terms of action, I've only had a chance to try this camera with motor racing so far, but it's still a much tougher test than athletics and a great start for the camera. Just before moving on, here's another couple of images I took with the viewfinder of a person deliberately positioned behind a panel with holes in it. Now with the full autofocus array enabled, I was impressed the 1DX Mark III confidently found and focused on the human subject rather than the wall in front of them. Moving on to the screen, Canon stuck with a 3.2 inch size display, although now with a panel using 2.1 versus 1.6 million dots. In live view, the Mark III employs dual pixel autofocus across almost the entire frame with a variety of focusing areas, including spot, expand, and zone modes. You can easily reposition the AF area by touch using the joystick or the new smart controller. Human face and eye detection is also available, although Canon's resisted implementing animal IAF, which could give Sony an advantage for wildlife photographers. With the mirror locked up in live view, the Mark III can now shoot even faster than with the viewfinder, up to 20 frames per second, whether using a silent electronic shutter or a proper mechanical shutter, and both supporting continuous autofocus. That's impressive stuff. 20 frames per second with autofocus using a mechanical shutter. Most rivals only allowed this kind of speed with an electronic shutter. I tried shooting the race cars in live view and found the system actually did a fair job, albeit not quite as confident or as quick to initially respond as shooting through the viewfinder. Now the longer baseline of the phase detect autofocus points in the viewfinder system are simply more effective and accurate than dual pixel AF when working at longer focal lengths, especially when the subject's initially blurred, for example when first entering the frame. That said, the Mark III in live view still delivered a respectable hit rate with the cars while enjoying broader coverage and supporting things like face and eye detection, plus with 20 frames per second you'll have plenty of images to pick from. Dual pixel is certainly an effective alternative for other types of subjects and of course drives the movie autofocus system, which I'll show you in just a moment. But before video, let's take a look at the image quality from the new sensor. As you know, the actual images from the Mark III contain the same number of pixels as the earlier Mark II, but Canon claims the images now contain more detail due to an improved low-pass filter, and that there's also lower noise and broader dynamic range than the earlier model. One of the most interesting aspects, though, is the adoption of the high-efficiency image format, HEIF, or HIF for short. 
This is a modern alternative to JPEG which employs the more efficient compression of HEVC video to deliver better looking images with smaller file sizes and with the possibility of greater dynamic range too. Apple introduced it to the mainstream on recent iPhones, but Canon's the first traditional camera company to offer it. In theory, it's a no-brainer over JPEG, but it's still early days for the format and your software may not support it yet, so bear that in mind if you want to edit or share HIF images. On the 1DX Mark III, you have to choose whether to record JPEG or HIF, although either can be recorded with an additional RAW file if desired. HIF is enabled from the HDR PQ menu, where you can also choose whether to prioritise mid or highlight tones in the processing. Once enabled, it effectively replaces JPEG in the menus, but you can switch back and forth whenever you like. Canon is using the HIF file extension for this format, and it's also possible to convert them into JPEGs using the camera in playback, which in theory could generate an image with a broader, or at least alternatively tone map dynamic range than a native JPEG created at the time of capture. Now you can only convert them one at a time in playback and I'd really like Canon with a firmware update to implement some kind of batch processing. Wouldn't it be really nice to record all your images in HIF for the best possible quality but then have the camera batch convert all of them to JPEG uh, so that you've got greater compatibility while you still need it. I took a number of shots to compare in-camera JPEG and HIF files using the 1DX Mark III to convert the latter into JPEGs for display here. Since this is the feature from the 1DX Mark III most likely to filter down across the range, I'll produce a dedicated video about them which I'll link to here once it's ready. In the meantime, here's an example from my test with a pre-production 1DX Mark III with a normal JPEG on the left and on the right a JPEG generated in camera from a HIF file captured by the 1DX Mark III using the default HDR tone mapping. You can see straight away that the JPEG converted from HIF on the right includes greater highlight detail, best seen in the clouds or on the highly reflective road surface. A viable alternative to JPEG has been a long time coming, but HIF certainly looks like it has great potential. Check out my separate video all about it for more information. Moving on, in terms of JPEG quality out of camera, here's a bunch of other images I shot with my test sample, again a pre-production body, but it should give you an idea of what you can expect. I'll retest the camera and compare its resolution, noise and dynamic range in the future when I get my hands on a final production sample. Check out Cameralabs.com for my latest results, samples and comparisons. Before moving on to video, here's a quick look at the low light noise performance of my pre-production body, starting at the lowest sensitivity of 100 ISO and gradually working up to the maximum sensitivity of 819,200 ISO. Yep, just shy of 1 million ISO. I'd say the quality looks great up to 12,800 ISO, but quickly begins to lose fine detail from 25,600 ISO upwards. Once you reach 204,800 ISO, the quality has greatly diminished, but still, that's almost a quarter of a million ISO. And remember, this is using in-camera noise reduction on JPEGs. Canon told me about cloud-based processing of RAW files in the near future, which could yield superior noise reduction than in-camera results. So watch this space, or watch this cloud. Oh, and finally, here's a comparison of the mechanical shutter on the right versus the electronic shutter on the left, both when panning at the same speed and shooting at 4,000th of a second. I specifically asked Canon about skewing using the electronic shutter and was told it was as well controlled as the Sony A9, but I'd say it's a little more visible here in terms of skewing, at least on my test sample, under these conditions. It's not the worst, but it's not the best either. That said, Unlike the A9, the 1DX Mark III can fire its mechanical shutter at 20 frames per second in live view, so if you don't mind the sound of it firing, you can avoid skewing while still enjoying the top speed. Which now brings me to the absolute wealth of video formats now available on the 1DX Mark III. I'm showing the menu options for PAL regions now and we'll show NTSC regions in just a moment and you are going to have to play this section a couple of times as well as looking up the specs on the Canon website if you're interested in video because there's just so many different options and numbers available I cannot go over all of them here. Now the earlier Mark II was one of the first to offer 4K at 60p but with a tight crop and inefficient motion JPEG compression. Now, the newer Mark III can film uncropped 4K up to 60p, or 30p if you want autofocus, with the much more sensible H.264 compression, or in 10-bit H.265 if you enable C-Log for later grading. You can also film in the wider Cinema 4K shape in uncropped or cropped formats up to 60p, 
and most options are available in the choice of IPB or all eye compression and for clips lasting up to half an hour. I, I did tell you you're going to have to play this bit twice. Impressively, the One DX Mark III also allows you to record raw video in 12-bit at 5.5K resolution. That's recording 5,472 by 2,886 pixels, which offers a noticeable boost over the 3840 by 2160 pixels of 4K UHD, although an understandably hefty bitrate typically working between 1800 and 2600 megabits per second, depending on the frame rate. These are stored in CRM files, and it's a very good reason why you need those CF Express cards. Just for the record, here's some clips that I filmed using the same focal length, first in 1080-25p, where the bitrate is 30 megabits per second in IPB or 90 megabits per second in all I. And now, filming in 4K UHD at 25p again, where the bitrate is 120 megabits per second in IPB or 470 megabits per second in all I. And next, in 4K UHD with C-Log enabled. C-Log records in 10-bit, but roughly matches the bitrates without due to using more efficient H.265 compression. Next, here's the slightly wider Cinema 4K format, uncropped, and now here it is in the cropped version, which is interestingly not available in the 16x9 UHD shape, at least not yet. Note the bit rates increase when filming 50 or 60p. Dual Pixel Autofocus is available for uncropped 4K between 24 and 30p, and here's an example where I'm using the touchscreen to pull focus. Dual Pixel Autofocus is also available for uncropped Cinema 4K and RAW 5.5K so long as you stick to frame rates between 24 and 30p. Sadly, if you choose 50 or 60p, Dual Pixel Autofocus is not available in any of the uncropped 4K, Cinema 4K or RAW formats, but there is one workaround. Switch to the cropped Cinema 4K format and Dual Pixel Autofocus becomes available all the way up to 60p. So it's just the uncropped 4K or RAW formats which don't support autofocus above 30p. Confused? You will be. Just play it back and read those specs again and again until it sinks in. If you're into slow motion, the 1DX Mark III can film 1080 up to 100p for PAL regions or 120p for NTSC regions for quarter speed playback. It's nice, but considering some cameras already offer 180 frames per second, I was really hoping for something at least as fast from the 1DX Mark III. Now, we all know Canon's dual pixel autofocus works a treat for face tracking, but here it is again, with the EF 70-200mm f2.8 just effortlessly delivering the goods. It works so well. Once again though, if you're filming in uncropped 4K or RAW formats, you'll only get autofocus up to 30p. Hmm, hang on. I know the screen doesn't flip round, and that there's no built-in stabilisation, but just for fun, before my final verdict, let's see if I can vlog with the 1DX Mark III. Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is a quick vlogging test with the Canon EOS 1DX Mark III. Of course, nobody's going to vlog with this camera, but you know I like to try these things out. So I'm filming this in 4K UHD at 25p with Servo AF using the 24-70mm f2.8 lens. f2.8, of course. Now, this camera does not have built-in stabilisation, and this lens doesn't have optical stabilisation, so I'm just using the movie digital stabilisation, which is available in two modes. This is normal. And this is the enhanced movie digital stabilization. All right, I think that's enough vlogging, so let's get on with the rest of this video. I've only had a brief time with the 1DX Mark III and a pre-production sample at that, but what I've seen so far is very impressive. Canon's packed in a wealth of important upgrades, crucially without getting in the way of the handling experience that pros have become familiar with. Owners of previous models can just pick up the Mark III and just start shooting without skipping a beat, and that's critical for the target market. Yeah, that's the right tool for this kind of job. Of the new features, I was fascinated by the use of an imaging sensor for viewfinder autofocus duties. It makes a lot of sense, and driven by deep learning, it really did do a great job at recognising and tracking people in often complex scenes. Coupled with the faster burst speeds, digi-kex processing and swift card writing, this is a camera that effortlessly handles action at the highest level, as it should. I was also fond of the new smart controller which quickly allows you to reposition the AF area and I hope it finds itself on other high-end Canon bodies in the future. It's also a relief to finally find a camera company offering an alternative to JPEG for compressed images and the HIF format certainly has a lot of potential, delivering better quality in similar or even smaller file sizes. This is surely the feature that will filter down the most throughout Canon's future models and hopefully the industry as a whole. 
Arguably the most controversial aspect about the camera is that it's still a traditional DSLR, but Canon firmly believes this is still its best technology for the very specific requirements of demanding professional sports photographers. Most notably, the absence of viewfinder lag, coupled with an AF system that outperforms dual pixel AF, especially for long telephotos. In Canon's world, mirrorless simply isn't there yet for this kind of job at this kind of level. Now, of course, Sony and others would disagree, but the final word will be to see which technology is most used at future sporting events. Although, of course, familiarity with earlier bodies, the toughness of those bodies, existing investment in pricey lenses and professional support at key events all come into play too. As a test of a pre-production body, that's about all I can say for now, but I'd love to hear what you think of the 1DX Mark III and Canon's decision to stick with DSLR for this flagship body, although do remember it's very, very specifically targeted at the needs of professional sports photographers. As always, if you find any of my videos useful, please do support me with a like and a follow, and if you really like them, you can treat me to a coffee or treat yourself to some Camera Labs merch or my in-camera photography book, and there's links to everything in the comments and description below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.